It's one of the most polluting industries in the world. It's one of the most work-intensive industries in the world. It affects 100% of the population. And so as a result, its impact is enormous, but so is its potential to lead. The reality is that your choices matter hugely. In your opinion, what's wrong with the fashion industry at the moment? Everything. The pace and the scale. The current model of the industry. Exploitation is rife. Driving the wages down and down and down. Lack of regulations. Toxic environment. There are finite resources. Take, make, chuck. Landfilled or incinerated. Forced to work overtime. Buying and buying and buying. And then mindlessly dumping. When you throw something away, you know, there is no away. Everything is wrong with the fashion industry. Sustainability means a lot of different things to different people, but I think in its broadest sense, it's about fashion that looks to do no harm to nature, um, restore balance with nature and um, provide opportunities to people without exploitation. The different areas of sustainability can cover topics such as waste and pollution. It could be looking at workers' rights. Rana Plaza disaster. Rana Plaza. Rana Plaza. Rana Plaza incident. Labour rights in the fashion industry has come to have been represented by one single incident which took place in 2013, and that is the collapse of the Rana Plaza factory complex, um, in which in about 90 seconds, 1,138 people were killed. The story of Rana Plaza hit the headlines and, uh, and galvanised millions of ordinary people to have to start to question and how are they responsible and what is their involvement in this industry which has led to so many deaths. And of course those deaths occurred because people were working in highly hazardous environments or working in factories with no safety regulations, rampant issues around sexual violence and sexual harassment. All of them uh, forced to work overtime and most are get paid below the poverty line at most about a dollar or a dollar fifty a day. They knew there was a problem with the building the day before. There were cracks already in the floor and the pillars of the Rana Plaza building and the workers left that day and the workers were forced to go back into that factory because they all had deadlines. One element that really shocked us about the Rana Plaza incident was when we were reading about the reports of brands calling up, having no idea whether their supply chain, their workers, were inside the factory. Often brands have no idea where their factories are and they also have no control over who is actually working and the sorts of environments that they're working in. I think that was a huge wake-up call for the fashion industry to understand that they must be responsible for what's going on in their own supply chain and that it's a reality check to understand that it's still going on today. I don't think anyone should be remotely comfortable with the state of the fashion industry today. There's greater awareness, but has, like, has anything actually changed? Not a lot. Environmentally, the fashion industry is one of the most destructive industries in the world. And that isn't hyperbole. At the moment, it has the biggest environmental impacts behind housing, transport and food. About 90 to 95 percent of all textiles used are cotton and polyester. And both of those materials have got sustainability issues related to them. The releasing of microfibers in the oceans due to the use of polyester fibers, uh, to the toxicity in rivers due to dyeing, and treatment of fabrics. And the cotton industry requires an incredible amount of toxic pesticides to allow cotton to grow. It also forces 
for the production of materials in the cheapest way possible. And the cheapest way possible, of course, is to use highly industrial methods that use highly toxic pesticides for fast growing, etc. We know that the majority of cotton is picked in Uzbekistan as a result of cotton irrigation demands. The Aral Sea is almost completely dry. Cotton is grown on arable land. That's land where you could grow food. We've got a growing global population of people that will need feeding. So there's going to start being a question about how responsible it is to continually be growing a crop to where when we need crop to eat. We know that these are finite resources, so we're going to need them and to use them in a much, much more responsible way. In the UK, 1.2 million tonnes of clothing is discarded and 300,000 tonnes of those clothes ends up in landfill and incineration and much of that is wearable. So we have a big waste problem. It impacts climate change because it has a big carbon footprint and also what we're doing is we're encouraging the fashion industry to create even more clothing which uses up huge amounts of resources including natural resources like land, energy and water. Fashion from Nature is an exhibition that I developed for the v &A. I wanted to do a good fashion exhibition with sustainability at its core. It tells a complicated, quite uneasy story about the relationship between fashion and nature. We've got positive and negative stories running alongside each other. We go back, say, to the 17th, 18th century, back 400 years. Uh, the principal fibres being used were vegetable fibres like linen and then cotton, and protein fibres, animal fibres, so silk from silkworms and wool from sheep. These are very versatile uh, materials, they each have their own qualities. They can be combined together to very good effect. But obviously, um, being derived from plants or animals, they are subject to disease and to a crop failure. And so, during the 19th century, people started looking for alternatives which were more reliable and potentially cheaper to produce. scientists and industrialists started researching uh, the possibility of making uh, fibres from cellulose. The two we still use today extensively are rayon, uh, for rayon viscose, um, and cuperonium. They were a major, major breakthrough. They were hugely exciting for people. They were used by couturiers as a new innovative fabric. Uh, they had their downsides. Um, they used um, terrible chemicals and some of the processes, particularly for viscose. Um, but then moving on in the 20th century, we get the first uh, fabrics made from fossil fuels, from coal and oil. So we get nylon being the first one. Again, an amazing, amazing fabric. Uh, the kind of success of sheer nylon stockings cannot be overestimated, the thrill that it gave people to wear stockings. And then we get successive generations of these um, fibres coming through. But um, again, they have many problems associated with their processing. And of course, we are now drawing very, very heavily on fossil fuels for energy of all kinds and also to make fibres. Is sustainability a passing trend? It's been trending for billions of years. I would reckon it is the other way around and this mass consumption and mass production is the passing trend. My name is Ursula de Castro and I'm the co-founder and creative director at Fashion Revolution. I am a designer by profession, that's how I started with a small brand called From Somewhere in 1997. We were the first brand to upcycle pre-consumer waste at scale. So Fashion Revolution really was Carrie Summer's idea. She had the idea in the bath <laughs> um, just after the Rana Plaza disaster, which was a moment where I guess the whole of the community was really shocked and you know the 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 collapse was both uh, predictable and avoidable and we all felt very much like something had to happen so fashion revolution is a global movement um, raising awareness to the impact social and environmental impact of the fashion industry on its supply chain 
on consumers and on the environment we all share. There are ways to become involved with, with governments and ask questions. There are ways to be an activist. There are ways to encourage a different type of consumption or relationships with the clothes that you've already got. The supply chain is, is very murky, very, very opaque. And without transparency, without visibility, it is easier to hide both environmental and human rights um, abuses. What we have at the moment is fast fashion. There isn't a better way to dress for less 24 hours a day. Now on sale from 9.95 to Which is a model based on producing, you know, billions of very short life pieces of clothing. The prices are low. No. That's which are kind of piled high and sold cheap and which people are encouraged to buy and then throw away like basically as quickly as possible. What fast fashion is doing is driving the wages down and down and down, driving conditions down and down and down and ramping up the amount of fashion that is being produced. Burlington silky woven. I think we're going to come to a crunch point like sooner rather than later if we carry on how we are. So I think, yeah, people should engage with secondhand clothing. Obviously, there are still problems with that. I think it may, makes us sort of feel like we can just, you know, consume as normal and then, then just recycle. They have spent a fortune on the newest shoe. Have twice as many dresses as the others do. Oh, she wears bracelets to hear me up to her ear. A lady is impressed unless her legs are too. Just like give it to the charity shops and everything's fine. Whereas, you know, a lot of it still ends up in landfill. A lot of it ends up decimating factory economies in like Southern Africa. My personal approach has always been is that you've got to start thinking collectively rather than individually. You know, you've got to basically just stop just thinking about yourself. We're a storytelling platform aimed to get the next generation excited about sustainability, consumption and climate. Like I first started Stories Behind Things because I really struggled with the mental health aspect of consuming so much, our throwaway culture, fast fashion. It really bothered me and I found it difficult to slow down. Creating Stories Behind Things was a way for me to reconnect to what we're using every day. I got into sustainability really through my love of shopping secondhand. I think that act of really taking your time when you're shopping and choosing what to bring into your life really helps you love it for longer. I think those pieces are the ones that you'll fix when they break. I often find that the pieces I buy on impulse are often the ones that end up on your bedroom floor or the ones that you don't really take care of. Whilst shopping secondhand is great, we wanted to find a fun way of swapping clothes in a more circular format. So we created a series called The Big Clothes Switch. How they work is we invite our community to bring up to five items that they're no longer loving from their wardrobes and trade them in for secondhand pieces that we've curated. Our mission with The Big Clothes Switch is to replace shopping, to give people that same dopamine hit of having something new, but it not being new from a store, just you know, from the existing millions and millions of items of clothing that are on this planet. We realized how many people felt the same as we did. The same eco-anxiety, the same concern for the future of our planet. So we started doing things like coffee mornings or meetups, which then turned into panelled events where we were exploring different areas of sustainability. We always end with actionable steps that our community can take to implementing action every single day. This year, I decided to take a stand for sustainability by creating these events that bring together eco brands and vintage pop-ups into one space. And I mix that together with talks from the industry and from the pop-ups that are here, um, sewing workshops and also um, swap shop as well, to share with people really how to, what it's called, style yourself sustainable. 
kind of just about people exchanging fashion, exchanging tips, exchanging clothes, especially in the garment industry. Like the exploitation is a complete product of our own consumerism and our choices in fashion and our choices in buying make a huge impact on the exploitation. Um, so this event is not just about swapping clothes and being sustainable, it's also about raising awareness about that. My name is Alex and I run a blog called So Rendipity. I write about um, sustainability and style and basically I'm trying to help people build a more meaningful wardrobe. Fixing things it really isn't rocket science. Uh, it's, it's actually, there's so many tutorials available. You, there's a lot of information available on how to do like basic repairs, like how to sew on a button, how to put up a hem, um, even how to take up trousers if you have to. Um, it's, it's really not that complicated. But I think the, just the desire to give it a go is the most important thing. What I'm hoping people take from the event is just um, a new level of mindfulness to really think about where the clothing's from, who's making it. Also, can you reuse what you have and um, use what there is in the world already in terms of using vintage, etc. If we can be more mindful of that and really make our clothes last a lot longer, that would be really awesome. We're here in a trade charity shop today, surrounded by clothes that might otherwise have gone to landfill and incineration. And at the core of everything that trade do is to extend the life of our clothes. What we do is we encourage people to pass on their clothes to trade for someone else to use. Trade is a UK charity and we've worked for nearly 20 years tackling the environmental and social impacts of producing our clothes, consuming clothes and disposing of our clothes. And we do this by providing reuse services to the UK public and to businesses. And then we complete this circle by committing the funds that we raise to projects that support the people and places making our clothes. So things like supporting cotton farmers to grow organic and eliminating child and bonded labour from the our supply chains. The problem with the fashion industry isn't fashion. We're not about knocking people's love of fashion. And at Trade, we're all about fashion. We're all about clothes. And we want to nurture people's love of clothes. But also what we want to do is we want to build sustainability into that love of clothes. Charity shopping still has some stigma, although that's changing. One of the things that makes Trade quite unique um, in terms of charity retail is how we stock our shops. The stock is selected for customer and location. We're not necessarily competing with other charities, we're competing with um, other retailers. Every day there's two managers at the front of the belt, so they, they're managers from individual shops and they know what they're looking for, they, they know what their customers are. We have two main categories, basic and premium, or kind of high street premium. If there's life left in it, there's someone would be willing to buy it and wear it. And it's a Marks and Spencer's um, silk summer dress. I can instantly see that it's fine, it's in good condition, there's no rips, there's no tears. The scarf is faded out and dirty, and the hat has been stretched out, so this is no good. You can actually get a high volume of things that are unsellable. And start to get quite an instinct for it. We got two different grades on that wholesale. The ones that can still be wearable, but it's not very good enough to be sold in a charity shop, is sold to these textile collectors and recyclers within UK, and they do a different kind of grading and export those clothing overseas. And then the third way is the items that completely cannot be wearable at all, because they are ripped, because they are so dirty or stained, 
That one, we got partnerships with the proper textile recyclers. That what they do is try to convert those textiles into different materials. Other clothing is being used to uh, fill car seats, to try to make something out of that clothing. Our main name, what we try to avoid is to put any piece of clothing into landfill. But I completely disagree in the sense that it will affect the local industry as the local industry is still producing, is still manufacturing and is still selling brand new goods. Typically with synthetic materials they can be recycled through a chemical process, get it back to being a, a, a virgin fibre as good as new and reused, rewoven, re-knitted and so on. With natural fibres it's probably more likely to be a mechanical process, um, so materials such as wool or cotton would be uh, shredded or uh, you know the materials could be um, then respun into yarn again. There are issues at the moment in terms of the technology with mechanical recycling and the, the quality of the, the, the yarn and the fibre tends not to be as good as new, um, which is why you tend to see a percentage of recycled textile used back in again, um, but they have to put that with um, new cotton, for example, to ensure that the material is still strong and is still going to um, be durable. Cotton is a natural fibre, obviously, but growing cotton uses massive amounts of pesticides and chemicals and water. So you've got that trade-off against using something like polyester, which is a byproduct of the petroleum industry, but does not biodegrade. Polyester can, cannot be recycled infinitely without losing um, some of its performance and quality, and it's a plastic. We all know about the damage that microplastics can cause when they get into waterways and into marine and aquatic life and potentially into the human food chain. About 90 to 95 percent of all textiles used are cotton and polyester and both of those materials have got sustainability issues related to them. So we really need to try and diversify a lot more of the materials that we're using. My name is Lizzie Harrison, I live in Bristol, I'm a fashion designer and I've been working in sustainable fashion for about 12 years running a fashion label. Antiform is a fashion label that I set up back in 2010. I was really interested in the types of waste materials and unwanted textiles that we had already around us and also all of the skills that we had within our community. And I thought, can I make and design a fashion label from what we already have? We're trying to plough a new way of doing things and the industry is so fast and we're trying to do something that is a lot slower, much more a kind of handmade and human scale. And how do you build a business out of that while trying to bridge those two timescales? We work first and foremost with the materials that are available and the skills that are available. Sometimes the materials will come directly from a manufacturer um, in those situations, we might be able to get quite a lot of information about the materials, but we may be asked to sign um, non-disclosure agreements with the brand because they don't want to talk about the waste that they have. We can generally um, establish the fibre composition, um, but we might not know where they've been made, who's made them, uh, who's worn them. This is our box jumper. The material that it's made from um, is from an absolutely amazing textiles mill up in that was up in Denby Dale called JT Knitting, and they used to supply all sorts of British fashion houses with knitted textiles. And they had some absolutely beautiful rolls of textiles that designers had ordered but never had paid and collected. It had been sitting in their warehouse, and when it came to their closing, they had to shift it or it was going to go into a skip. And it was so sad to go and see all of the, you know, one of the last bits of our sort of textiles heritage being packed up and we got the last couple of rolls that they ever produced super wearable and really popular we will produce a collection we will put it out there 
on our website, we'll send it out to our buyers and then it will last as long as it lasts. It's completely broken us free from this constant having to come up with something new, sell it, sell it for a short period of time, discount it, sell it off at a discounted price and then and get back on it. So we don't do a sale anymore because our products are priced at a fair price. They cost what they cost to make and they're available as long as they're available. It may well be that we're looking at entirely new models. Some people are talking about moving towards a more, a, a more rental type of business model. Um, companies perhaps will have to take more responsibility for clothing after the point of sale, so they will be responsible for end of life, end of use. We may well see that legislation comes in. One of the biggest constraints to bringing production closer to home is the cost. So if we have robots in fashion factories, we won't have such cost issues and potentially production could move back to the countries where the clothes are sold. So that would really change the dynamics of the industry. I think we also have to remember that the fashion industry has been a massive boon to a lot of countries. It's helped with their economic development and it's provided a lot of employment for people who otherwise would not have been able to get out to work. I think we've got to be very careful if people are going to be displaced by robots and automation that we actually have additional or alternative jobs for them to move to. Tame and Me as a brand is the bringing together of my skills and Tame's skills. So we're two women from two sides of the world who make clothing in a sustainable way that, that benefits Tame's community but also teaches us here in the UK and in the Western world, how clothing is made and what that entails. The two of us met uh, in the market in 2017 and she immediately was so friendly and so kind. And she said to me, did I want to learn how to make their embroidery? I said, yes, of course. I went then every day uh, for the next three months and learn how to make this tiny piece of embroidery. It was the most beautiful and intense experience that I've ever done. It, and it happened that we just got on really well. I felt like I wanted to give her something back. I started to buy their vintage textiles and to sell them in the UK. It felt like an, an immediate way to give money to the village, which actually is a very poor village, but it didn't feel like a long-term sustainable project. It's almost like a workwear jacket. It's something that is really versatile. It's a unisex piece. It's got a zero waste cut, which is because it's based on the really traditional piece of clothing. This is Tame's village, in fact, and this is the embroidery that I learned how to make. They um, always make new clothes for themselves and their families each year, and they are covered in embroidery. That's something that if they don't do it as women, they don't make their new clothes each year, then they're considered lazy and they're not respected by the village. We buy the old pieces of embroidery, so we're trying to do it in a way that really complements their needs and is able to give them a bit of an income but also encourage them to keep on making for themselves and for their families as a priority. It's really difficult to tell how long a jacket actually takes because each process fits into the different parts of the year and the calendar. We don't have any kind of toxic waste, which is quite phenomenal, really. Tame runs the production in Vietnam, so we work on a really like who needs what kind of basis. It's really important that everybody's happy in a workforce, I think. That's, yeah, like, of course. <laughs> it's about retracing every step of a process of a garment and then examining how to do that in the best way possible, um, using traditional skills and finding artisans who still make in the most handmade way, which for me um, is where beauty lies.
I think it's fundamentally important that we do educate fashion designers, actually thinking about the end of life of the products that they're designing at the very early stages. So when they're designing a product, they can think about materials that they're going to use and what will happen to these materials when the garment reaches the end of its life. My name's Helen Newcomb, I'm the founder of Davy J Swimwear. We're a new brand, we're only a year old, and this is our first opportunity to exhibit at London Fashion Week in the designer showrooms. And we're a sustainable brand, so um, all of our swimwear is made using Econo yarn, which is 100% regenerated from waste. So things like fishing nets, plastic scraps, um, offcuts from carpets, all regenerated, turned back into nylon yarn, and then made into things like our swimwear. We also look very much at a circular economy side, so building products to last, fighting that trend of, um, of fast fashion, building things to last, and also encouraging consumers to send products back to us at the end of their life. So we look at resources as a kind of longer term use rather than just a product reaching the end of its life and going in the bin. What we are seeing is that a lot of companies are looking at alternative dyeing processes. Dyeing uses massive amounts of water, so we're seeing things like foam dyeing, we're seeing things like using sound waves to, to push dyes into fabrics, laser finishing rather than some of the more traditional finishing processes that we would have seen in factories. The dry dye process used carbon dioxide which was pressurised until it became super critical and that was used to push the dye into the fibres. But the process as I understand it is, is very expensive and it can only be used on polyester. So it really hasn't taken off in the way that we expected that it might have done when we initially heard about it. So there's a lot of work going on. Machinery is becoming more efficient. Companies are finding ways to dye products without using as much water. And again, it's an area that we're seeing an awful lot of research carry, carried out at. Education is uh, really putting sustainability on the agenda um, and particularly at the London College of Fashion um, for the last 10 years it's been really something that we focused on and made a priority. Ten years ago the Centre for Sustainable Fashion was established which is a research centre and they've done a huge amount of work to embed sustainability into the curriculum and also develop world-class research and industry partnerships. We're preparing them for the industry that they're going into. This really is the, the, the issue of our time, but it's really, really huge and that can be quite hard for students to grasp. And really sustainability wasn't something that was covered in lectures, it wasn't something really that I was being taught about. Um, and that has changed a lot. So it's really giving them the tools and the knowledge to be able to um, build sustainability into their own practice while they're studying. And it gives them that knowledge uh, and awareness that's really going to benefit them when they start their career. There are lots of companies looking at waste. Waste is a bad name. Waste is not rubbish. Waste is a resource. Um, and there are more and more companies now bringing that to our attention. So Vegia, who are an Italian company, are producing an alternative um, vegetable leather 
uh, made from the waste products of the wine industry, which of course is huge in Italy. And so they use the pips to make a bio oil and the skin and the stalks uh, to make the kind of matter of the product. Um, and this is proving very successful. Another way forward, which is associated particularly with the 21st century, is biodesign. So biomimicry is not new, but the Californian company Bolt Thread used biomimicry uh, to make a new micro silk. Um, so they looked at the DNA of spider silk, which is incredibly strong and elastic. And they um, developed a fermentation process whereby they could create a protein with the same molecular profile as spider silk. And they've developed um, a new fiber and they're collaborating now with Stella McCartney. Um, and in the exhibition, we have some of the first garments uh, realized in micro silk, defined by Stella McCartney, who is very, very um, ahead of the game in materials innovation. The fashion industry absolutely has to be investing in new technology. We're looking at 3D design and prototyping tools. We're looking at 3D printing. We're looking at blockchain, virtual reality, augmented reality, robotics, robot systems, um, and, and a lot of automation. We are certainly seeing a lot of automation and roboticized systems in certain processes within apparel production, but we're not yet seeing it from the end to end system and, and sewing is one of the biggest areas, particularly for ro robotics where it's not happening. The biggest challenge in incorporating robotics into sewing lines is that it's very difficult for robots to replicate the dexterity of the human hand. But what we are seeing is, for example, things like automated attachment of collars, um, automated pocket systems, robotic arms um, in, in needle checking. So it, they're, they're certainly making their way into the industry, but as I say, not in a big way at the moment. It certainly hasn't got to mass adoption. Lots of brands capitalise on the fact that they make us feel like we need to buy stuff in order to be happy. The role that influencers, celebrities, brands can play is huge. You just get wrapped up in this multi-million pound marketing campaigns making us feel like we need to buy more stuff. And we don't need to. We really want to highlight the idea of progress over perfection. You know, everybody is on their journey to living more in line with their values. Nobody is perfect. Everyone has made mistakes. And, you know, highlighting the aspect of accessibility, what is possible for people to do every day. So for us, we don't want people to overconsume. Instead, we like to teach people how to inject new life into those same items. That could be stitching over a hole that's broken. On average, let's say a piece of clothing goes through 20 hands before it gets to us. You know, we need to reconnect that respect for the items that we're using every day. There is such a huge range of things that we can do to be more sustainable with our fashion habits. It's just about making you feel supported with whichever route you take, and that's what we're here for. We're seeing a lot of projects in all sorts of areas, be it technology, being it trying to develop new business models, 
the development of alternative materials. And a lot of these projects are still very small scale, so there needs to be a lot of collaboration between brands, manufacturers, retailers who are traditionally competitors. We have to see them coming together to scale up some of these ideas and we, we are seeing a massive amount of change and, and, and a lot of companies really do care. I think it's perhaps all too easy to focus on occasions where effluent is illegally discharged or there are violations in terms of uh, labour rights. So I think we should also look at the very positive stories out there. In order to remake um, fibre, we have to understand how to recycle them to produce really good quality fibre that the public will trust. And our problem is that so many of our fibres are blended fibres because fibres have different qualities and they often work better combined together. But we have this fantastic dictionary of fibres and it's how they're made that is often wrong. If we can devise good ways, better ways of making them, that is a step forward. It's too easy to say if one thing is good and another thing is bad. Uh, we need to look at their quality and the ways in which we make them and use them and dispose of them. There is no one silver bullet sort of sustainable material that's going to fix all the problems. Um, you've always got to sort of balance it out. So really looking at that, how we can maybe slow the fashion system down. It's moving so fast now and we're talking about such huge volumes um, and those are just increasing at the moment. relationship with clothes can, can change and shift and the economy is less about sort of consumption and volume and growth. Uh, it could be more about you know reuse and sharing um, and in that way we can maybe close the loop and reuse clothes for much longer um, and, and make use of that valuable resource.